Hello and welcome to today's APS Stamp Chat. My name is Scott Tiffany, Librarian and Director of Information Services at the American Philatelic Research Library. Joining me today is Dr. Greg Redner, presenting today's APS Stamp Chat titled The Philately of the 1920 Antwerp Olympics. Stamp Chats like this are made possible through the generous support of APS members and the Mighty Buck Club. If you want to learn more about APS membership or the Mighty Buck Club, please visit our website at stamps.org. Before we begin today's session, we have a bit of housekeeping first. For those watching live, your microphone and camera will be disabled during the presentation. Throughout the presentation, you can use the chat box in Zoom to share your thoughts and comments with fellow attendees. If you have any questions for Dr. Redner, please submit those in the Q&A box and we will get to your questions following the presentation. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Dr. Greg Redner. Greg has been a stamp collector since the age of eight. A specialist in the stamps of Belgium, Greg also has also collected the stamps of his and my home country of Canada since his late teens. He has presented internationally on the Railway Parcel Post of Belgium and his article on the philately of the Antwerp Olympics appears in this month's edition of the Canadian Philatelist. Greg is also a musician by trade and serves as the director of music at the Metropolitan United Church in London, Ontario, Canada, where he is also an assistant professor at my alma mater, the University of Western Ontario. Greg holds a master's degree in organ and harpsichord from the Juilliard School and a PhD in film studies from Executor University in the United Kingdom. Now to introduce today's presentation. The 1920 Antwerp Olympics was a story of war, nationalism, and panicked preparation. The international event was also the first large scale attempt to use postage stamps and cancels to advertise an Olympic game. Now sit back as Greg Redner leads us through this fascinating and little explored area of Olympic philately. Welcome, Greg, and thank you for being with us today. Thanks, Scott, uh, and thank you everybody for being uh, here for this presentation today. Uh, I'm very honored. Uh, I've been a APS member at various times throughout the last, um, since 1987. And um, I'm very, very proud and pleased to be able to be here and feel honored. So thank you for that. Um, as, as Scott said, I, my, my primary area of collecting is uh, Belgium, although I still collect uh, quite a bit of my home country of Canada. And somewhere about 10 years ago, I got really interested in the stamps and events that followed the end of World War I. Um, and there are some remarkable stories in those issues. And uh, so that's how I have ultimately got involved in this discussion about the 1920 Antwerp Olympics. Um, these Olympic Games are not one of the fancier ones for reasons which you will see um, as we go through this. Um, the stamps themselves, as one of my colleagues in the UK said to me, why do you collect these stamps? I mean, they're not particularly beautiful, and uh, there are only three of them, and it's, they're not like the Greek ones or the ones from Amsterdam in, you know, 1924 or, or 1928 or uh, Paris in 1924, but it's really the story that fascinates me. Um, and so I hope you'll find that interesting um, and that maybe this will open the door to uh, thoughts of Olympic collecting, which is a really thriving area of uh, recording in progress. Okay, well, um, the 1920 games were the first ones to take place after World War I ended. Uh, the the most the closest um, preceding uh, games took place in 1912 in Stockholm. Um, Germany had been scheduled to host the 1916 games, but for obvious reasons, uh, that never took place. Um, the 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 Belgians were very interested in hosting the 1920 games as early as the beginning of the period around 1910. Um, but Budapest always had uh, an, an inn um, because it was a great a city of great, you know, historic and cultural uh, prominence. Um, and 
they had actually been tentatively awarded the games uh, prior to the beginning of World War I. And of course, Hungary was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire um, and as such an ally of Germany. So when the war was over, uh, there was very little chance of them, um, well, zero chance of them getting the games. They were awarded to Antwerp um, and to Belgium in, in great, uh, in, to great extent because of the devastation that Belgium had experienced during the war. The, the Germans wanted to pass through Belgium on their way to attack France, and King Albert and the, and the government said that this was not possible. So the Germans attacked the city of Liege uh, on the eastern uh, uh, border of, of Belgium, and that began the occupation of Belgium. Uh, the city of Liege was defended valiantly for almost 11 days uh, before it fell. And some historians believe that th that amount of time, the Germans thought it would take considerably less time to be able to, uh, to move through Belgium into France, uh, actually allowed the French and the British the time to uh, m mobilize and, and prevented the Germans from getting much further into France than they did. Uh, Belgium was punished uh, because of their decision to not allow the Germans to pass through. Uh, and there was great scale starvation and, uh, and a good deal of um, war crime and atrocities uh, that took place. So when the war was over, it was decided what a wonderful thing to show the world that Belgium is on the, on the rebound and that we can celebrate their, hero their bravery and their heroicism. Um, in all, 29 nations took part in the 1920 Olympics. Uh, there were roughly 2,600 athletes participating. Um, 22 sports were held. Only 60 of the participants were women, and these were largely uh, members of the swimming and diving teams. Um, the athletic performance at the 1920 Games was extremely low. Uh, in terms of its uh, performance and quality. And there was no one like Jim Thorpe at the 1912 Stockholm Games who won both the pentathlon and the decathlon. But it makes sense when you think about it because most of the young men and women would have been affected by the war experience. A lot of them would have died. Some of them would have been injured. Um, and none of them were up until six to eight months before actually thinking about taking part in Olympic games. Uh, so it's not one of the great athletic games. The Germans and the members of the Austro-Hungarian Empire were ostracized from the games. And this caused a lot of concern amongst, uh, strangely, some of the uh, nations of Europe and even amongst the U.S. who was uh, who, who was concerned that if these were the games of peace, that this would be a wonderful time to start to rebuild um, a world community. Um, but the Belgians would have no part of it. And so they insisted that the Austria-Hungarian um, uh, contingent be ostracized. Um, this is a wonderful cover that shows our first um, glimpse of the, Bel of the Antwerp Olympic Council. We'll talk more about that later. Um, it was from the SPA conference. The SPA conference is, was held very close to Antwerp, and it was the, the conference at which the Germans were forced to come to, um, to, to accept the fact that the coal that they took from the Tsar region um, and uh, the and their armaments were going to be drastically uh, reduced. Um, it was held almost contemporaneous with the actual Olympic Games, um, and there's some belief that the games uh, that the SPA conference was held where it was 
uh, specifically so that Germany would be embarrassed by saying, you have to come to these conferences, uh, which is which are going to greatly punish your country, but you're not a good enough nation to participate in the Olympics. Of course, this is a wonderful cover because it's uh, sent to the major that was in charge of the daily routine, and it says commission of reparations on it. Of course, they're also, much like we're experiencing today, uh, were concerns about the Spanish influenza pandemic. Um, there's not a lot of a lot written about the effect that this had on the athletes and the games and people's decision to come or not come. Uh, but there is a, a, a report in the American uh, committee report on these Olympics. It said that seven athletes who had participated um, died in from exposure to the flu while they were in Belgium. Uh, attendance at the games themselves was actually quite light, um, partly because the weather was absolutely terrible. It was a cold, dark, rainy, late summer, early fall in uh, that part of Northern Europe. Um, but that probably wasn't the only reason. Uh, this was still a very poor country, um, and there was a lot of devastation, and people were just trying to rebuild their lives. The tickets were not inexpensive, and so um, most people just simply couldn't afford to go. Uh, then there's the fact that the games organizers, um, of course, all of whom would have been uh, – members in one way or another of the upper crust of the Belgian, a Belgian society didn't want it to be advertised as anything other than a games um, of, of gentlemen and, and, and gentle women, we can say now, uh, which was Bar uh, Baron Pierre de Coubertin's uh, vision for the Olympics that no professional should be able to participate. Um, and so they were very anti-press and there's not a lot written about the actual event uh, from the Belgian side. Little historic background on the venues. Um, obviously, uh, Belgium was given this great honor, which uh, most of the Belgian government was did not think was a great honor, um, very late, um, a, a, as late as April 1919, uh, the games opened in late August, early September of 1920. When you think of the amount of time that people have to prepare for Olympic Games today, um, 16 months doesn't seem like a very long time, especially when your city's been completely devastated. Um, so what they did was they they built a beautiful Olympic stadium, which is still exists today uh, and is very beautiful. But they tried to make use of buildings that had been um, devastated or where there were parts of the buildings left for other um, venues. And this is one of the great ones. Um, this is the moat that actually used to surround the citadel uh, of Antwerp. The citadel was raised by German artillery, um, but they decided, what do we need to create a swimming venue for when we've got this moat? So they just constructed basically lanes in the middle of the moat, uh, and um, it led to some very interesting stories. Uh, this is a, a, and a wonderful copy on the left-hand side of the Olympic swimming regulations, which I have um, in my collection and prize. Um, the problem was the moat was a spring-fed uh, body of water. It wasn't heated, and it wasn't a um, and it wasn't a uh, uh, an enclosed body of water. So most of the uh, temp most throughout August, the temperature was sub um, probably 20 degrees in terms of American uh, Fahrenheit 
below what most swimmers would have swum, swum in. And there are stories of the Australian water polo team having to be rescued because several of them had developed hypothermia and one of them almost drowned. Um, Johnny Weissmuller has the best quote on this. Uh, if you don't know him as an Olympic swimmer, you will know him as one of the great Tarzans of all time. He said, the only thing faster than the American swimming team were the Belgian rats that regularly swam next to us. Um, he didn't seem to uh, indicate whether the rats ever won any Olympic races, but uh, it was not a happy was not a happy experience for swimmers. Other challenges: transportation to the games, particularly uh, from the U.S. Uh, there's a famous story with that, but a lot of the bell, a lot of the European rail lines had been uh, affected, and it was not easy to get people there. Um, the American story involves this ship on the card. Um, which was a originally a German um, passenger ship, but was appropriated um, at the beginning of World War I by the U.S. and renamed the Princess Matoika and used as a transport ship. Um, they made the, the decision to send 250 athletes uh, from the U.S. to Belgium on this ship um, which, as you can kind of tell from the picture, was not necessarily in the spiffy of, of condition at the time. It also had the name of, uh, of the ship of death uh, because it carried a lot of bodies home from France. Uh, so over the course of the several weeks journey between um, Hoboken, New Jersey and, and uh, Antwerp, uh, there was a near mutiny, uh, which is called mutiny on the Matoika, uh, where all the athletes had had enough of it. It was hot. They were stuck down in the hold and uh, they were not happy about it. So uh, that they were, they almost threatened to refuse to participate when they got to Antwerp. Housing was terrible. There were a lot of broken uh, glass, uh, very little in the way of windows left in a lot of the buildings. A lot of them didn't have um, electricity, running water. There was no Olympic village, so they had to find places to put them. Um, the, there were no beds, actually, for a lot of the athletes to sleep in until the U.S. Army agreed to leave the cots that they had sent um, with the Army when they arrived for uh, World War, to participate in World War I. Uh, so that provided some sense of a sleeping arrangement. Food was regulated at one sardine and one piece of bread for breakfast. Nobody says anything at all about the uh, about lunch and dinner. Um, we've talked about the rats and the hypothermia. So it was a tough situation for everyone. Um, probably the, the worst conditions uh, experienced were the poor Dutch athletes who were housed on what was essentially a barge, which was located at the Bonaparte dock. Uh, this is a picture of that dock down in the industrial area. Some new traditions appeared at these games. Uh, this is the first time that the Olympic flag flew. Um, Pierre de Coubertin had envisioned and, and created the idea earlier. Um, and suddenly when the games came to Antwerp, somebody said, wait a minute, there's this flag, let's use it. Uh, so they raised it, and the man in the picture is a wonderful story. He was the little boy who raised the flag at the Olympic Games. At the end of the Olympics, he took it down and nobody wanted it, so he folded it up and put it in his closet. Um, and somebody said, oh, that's a very interesting flag. And he said, well, that was the flag from the Olympic Games. And I think it sold at, um, at auction recently for $80,000 or something like that. Um, so there he is as an older man. Uh, also, the first time that the Olympic uh, oath was given to the athletes. And it's the first time that the first, second, and third place winners were given um, were given medals, uh, gold, uh, silver, and bronze. Before that, they had been given some um, really ugly vases and trophies and uh, things like that. Um, this is a, a participation medal from my collection. I can't afford to uh, buy a 
even a bronze medal, they're so expensive, but the participation medal slightly less. And I think it's a really beautiful uh, example of the quality work that was done, uh, at least metal work. Now for Canadians, and I'm assuming there are a few Canadians on this, uh, this was also the Olympic Games at which hockey was introduced to um, uh, Olympic play. Um, figure skating and uh, hockey took place in April prior to the actual opening of the Summer Games. Um, I'm very proud to say that the Canadian team, which was made, which was from Winnipeg and was known as the Falcons, they were all Icelandic immigrants uh, who lived in Winnipeg, the geographical center of Canada. Um, they crushed everyone they played against, and throughout the entire tournament, only one goal was ever scored against them. So, go Canada. There were other um, disturbing events that took place, um, sporting events. Um, there was a, a referee um, who had refereed the um, second to the last game um, that the Belgian team played, uh, and they were not happy with the way he had called the game. He had been out very late the night before, and they thought he was not in fit condition to do it. Uh, they were very upset when he ended up being named the referee for the uh, uh, game, the gold medal game between Belgium and Czechoslovakia. Um, he made some calls which made both teams very angry. Um, the Czech team decided they'd had enough of it. They walked off the field. They were disqualified. Uh, the, some of the fans from the stands ran onto the field and beat the referee up. Um, uh, luckily for the Belgian team, they weren't disqualified and uh, they ended up winning the gold medal and uh, the Spanish team was second. That's a picture of them on the left. And that's a picture of the mayhem that concluded the game between uh, Belgium and Czechoslovakia. Famous participants in the games. This was the first appearance of the Flying Finns, um, whose, one of whose runner, Pavo Nurmi, uh, would go on to win, I think, gold medals at three Olympic Games, maybe four. Um, they were a very famous team at the time and the first team to actually train in a scientific manner. Um, Duke Kahanamoko, if you remember watching ABC's Wide World of Sports um, back in the 60s and 70s, there was also always the Duke Kahanamoko Surfing Championship from uh, Hawaii. Uh, what most people don't know about Duke is that he also was a multi-game gold medal winner and one of the finest uh, swimmers of his day. Okay, so now we're into the things that were produced for the games and some philatelic uh, material. Um, I love this card. Um, it's a, an identity card that allows the athlete to travel at a discount on any Belgian rail lines. Um, Joseph Pierman was the silver medalist in the, uh, in the 10,000 10, meter walk, walk race. Um, and remarkably, there was actually a video of the end of it on YouTube. I was shocked to see it. So if you really are interested in that, you can find it on YouTube. Um, why I love this is because my other favorite area of collecting is Belgian railway stamps. So this stamp here is an example of a Belgian railway or parcel post cancel uh, that was issued from the Antwerp Central Station. Uh, so it collects both of my um, both of my um, philatelic passions very nicely. Uh, the games were opened by King Albert uh, on August the 20th and closed on September the 12th. This is a very famous um, image of King Albert. Um, there's a famous photograph that was taken in a barn in England, which was where his government was in exile, um, and I'm, I'm certain you've seen it in history books, but it was the model for what is known as the tin hat uh, victory issue of Belgium. And these were the first stamps that were issued after the war. Um, they'll come into play a little bit later on in our story, but uh, it's a really, really sp spectacular stamp. Um, 
to aid in publicizing the games, the Belgian government made the decision to issue three commemorative stamps. Um, we'll see in a minute that this hadn't been done with any great frequency before this. Um, and this has no philatelic significance. It's just a, an original program that's in my collection and I wanted you to see it because I, <clears throat> I think it's very beautiful. The first uh, Olympic Games or government that issued stamps were the 1896 uh, Greek government for the first modern games that took place in Athens in 1896. Um, and these are, these are, you know, the everyone who collects Olympic stamps loves these. Remember this image of the discus thrower because it too will come in a bit later. Uh, the idea for the postal issues came from a man named Gaston Selen, who was a well-known designer and a chairman of a charity that endeavored to support wounded veterans. Uh, in a letter of the 8th of May, 1919, to the Minister of Public Works, uh, Selen suggested that the stamps uh, be issued with a surcharge. So the stamps we're talking about are semi-postals in, in American terminology. Um, and the proceeds would go towards the support of the charity for wounded veterans. To begin with, um, he suggested that they only produce one stamp, a 10 uh, cent issue featuring um, the quadriga. Um, and he loved the qua this, um, uh, these four horses, which appear at, in uh, St. Mark's Church in Venice. Um, they're very ancient and very beautiful, and he thought uh, that image of those horses being uh, pulling a chariot uh, would be a lovely thing to do. Um, however, the committee did not like the idea because they thought that that was too similar to the uh, to one of the stamps that had been issued by the Greek government for the 1896 uh, Olympic Games. And you're gonna laugh at this later on because you'll see that uh, nobody paid the least bit of attention to what the committee thought. Uh, this is a, a, a picture of the uh, committee that brought the games to Belgium and they're there on the uh, day that the first stone is being laid for the Olympic Stadium. Uh, so in August of 1919, uh, Minister Rankin uh, wrote to the Belgian Olympic Committee to see if they were really interested in providing and having a stamp issued for this. The committee replied that they only had two requirements. One was that the stamps be based on classical themes. They were very worried that something modern and tasteless would be used that would embarrass them uh, in terms in the eyes of the world, uh, and that the stamps had to contain the uh, city of Antwerp, the name of the city of Antwerp. Uh, they had hoped that Georges Montagnes, who was the greatest, in my opinion, of the engravers working on stamps in those days, um, would design the stamp and engrave the stamp for them. But uh, he just felt it was too short to turn around in such a you know, in under a year to do a quality job. So he decided not to be involved. Uh, this is a beautiful example of uh, one of the King Albert small head uh, stamps, which is just lovely, I think, um, engraved by Montagnes. Um, so that they went to the Dutch firm of Johanna Shede and Sons, um, but they were busy with the production of the tin hat stamps that we saw earlier. There are quite a few of them there. I think they're 10 or 11. Um, and th because these were the victory stamps and, and were the, the image they presented to the world of the fact that Belgium had survived, uh, they really felt that they had to concentrate on that. Um, but they did submit three designs, uh, which were all based on antiquity and none of them were used. Who got the contract? Well, the American Banknote Company in New York did. Um, and uh, we'll see why, perhaps why, uh, in a second. This is the American Banknote Company uh, uh, headquarters in lower New York. Okay, so uh, the Belgium, uh, in, I'm very grateful to a man named Lawrence Yonker, um, who is a Belgian uh, 
Olympic collector who specializes in the 19... 19- 28 Amsterdam games and is one of the legendary uh, exhibitors and scholars on all things to do with the Olympics, but that in particular. Um, He helped me and also in his book, I was able to find um, letters that most people don't think exist. Um, And so this information comes in great part from his wonderful work. And so I want to make sure that I give him uh, thanks for that. Um, a letter uh, from December 1919, set by the uh, Director General of the Belgian Post, agreed to purchase 5 million copies of each of the three stamps at a cost of $7,500 from the American Banknote Company. Um, however, there's an internal memo from six months earlier that shows that the government was really concerned about the financial weight um, and that this was going to put on the post service. Um, As we said, why did the American banknote company get the uh, contract? If you looked, they offered um, uh, Uh, 2.7 francs for a thousand stamps, as opposed to uh, Waterloo and Sons from London, who offered 4.4, let's say, and uh, and Shede, who had finally agreed to do it for three Point zero five, um, and so money seems to have been played a place in this. Now, until recently, um, the general consensus was that there's very little production material, uh, that uh, very little in the way of essays, um, nothing really in terms of, um, of uh, plate proofs or anything like that. Um, because uh, we don't even know actually who engraved the stamps or designed them. There's no record in the American Banknote Company archives. Uh, And that seems maybe to be because they were turned around so quickly. Um, But at any event, there are a few things out there. Um, This is an unused essay for the five cent um, example. You can see on the bottom, it says, you know, for the, uh, the wounded uh, in war. And this is uh, something that's just come up uh, now on David Feldman, and I wish I could afford to buy it, but there's no way I will ever be able to afford it. Uh, This is actually a a photo, uh, not a photo, a print of a Greek runner uh, that served as the basis um, for the 15 centime uh, stamp. And what's interesting is they basically have grayed out the remainder of uh, the engraving. Um, and what's what's unique about this is that they you can actually see where they've changed the hair, uh, the left arm, and the knee in this. So remember this because this is very close to what we'll end up with. Uh, and uh, here is a photo proof. Um, of the engraving. Um, This is fascinating um, because if you look at the next slide that I'm going to show you, you can see the number of changes that were suggested um, once these were, once this photo proof was done. Uh, These came up on eBay about six years ago, I think. And um, man, I wish I had been looking for them at the time. Um, They're really quite spectacular. Um, And again, if you look here, you'll see that this is the photo proof that we were just looking at. Um, And the one concern, the one thing that changes that matters to us is um, the addition of the plus sign uh, between to show that this was not just a 15 centime stamp, but it had a five cent surcharge on it. It really just mind-blowingly beautiful. And uh, this is uh, American Bank Note document showing the final approved design, which was printed on glazed paper and dark sepia. Not a particularly clean strike, but... Now, um, I was really lucky this past summer when I was away on vacation. Um, I, like, I search, you know, at least twice a week for information from and and material from this uh from this olympics 
And someone posted uh, in, on Del the Belgium line, 1919 19 to 1932 or whatever it is, um, Olympic stamps on card. And I thought, wow, I have a strange feeling those are proofs. Um, and I was absolutely shocked to discover when I got them that they are um, a very, very, very rare proof um, from what appears to have been only one card. Um, I know there are actually considerably less than 20 of these, and potentially um, there are less than five of these out there. Um, so I was very lucky to get them, and I won't tell you what I got them for, but I felt kind of guilty about it. Okay, after seeing the proofs, uh, Minister Rankin believed that the stamps would be a great success. So he made one of his most colossal mistakes. The American banknote company said, you know what? We'll double the order of stamps. We'll give you 30 million stamps, and we will uh, take a 10% discount off of them. So $13,500 $13, for, that should actually be 3 million stamps. Sorry about that. Um, why is this a bad thing? You'll find out in a second. The stamps were transported on the Red Star Line and arrived in April and May of 1920. So the turnaround time is very small on these, uh, very short. Uh, this is a wrapper sheet that does not belong to me, but it's a beautiful thing, giving information about the stamps that are included in that package. And here are the three stamps. Um, again, the discus thrower. Um, this looks remarkably like the quadriga, uh, the chariot and horses that the Greeks issued. Um, and here's our friend, the marathon runner uh, that we've seen in the, in the uh, essays. So the stamps were printed in sheets of 100. The margins included various inscriptions. It's not difficult even today to find um, uh, selvage and stamp that say American Banknote Company on them. And they're always printed in the color of the actual stamp. Um, but it is very, very hard to find any plate numbers in these. Um, and so the plate numbers don't appear uh, prominently. And so when you actually uh, see one, you should buy it because they're quite valuable. Um, and of course, any stamp that goes into the British um, postal distribution house has a mark that says depot and the year, uh, so 1920. Now the stamps were produced extremely quickly and because of this, the quality of the issue suffers. Um, I did, a, I did a, an ex exhibition, uh, entered my stamps in an exhibition uh, at the Royal for, uh, in Canada here last month. And one of the comments was, you know, you really need to find a better centered and cleaner copy of that 15 song team marathon runner stamp. And I, I wanted to say, but I didn't. Um, if you can find me one, I will gladly buy it. Um, the quality of the paper is not great. Um, the stamps are badly off center. Um, the perforations are not clean. Um, and so if you find one that's well-centered and doesn't have horrendous perfs, you're actually doing, you know, very well. Um, it also contains all of the cancellations and stamps contain one consistent mistake. And that is the seventh Olympiad, 1920. Um, Olympiad refers to the period between two Olympic games, not an Olympic games. Um, we were talking about this the other day, and I think both the French uh, in Paris at 1924 and also the Dutch in Amsterdam followed the same, um, the same practice, uh, but that's actually a mistake and uh, may have come because of the rushed production. So the stamps, as we know, they were surcharged uh, five cents. Uh, this was a lot of money for the average citizen. They weren't able to, a lot of them weren't able to afford it. So this meant that generally only people of means could afford the stamps, which means that that combined with the very small size of the stamps and the inability 
to clearly read what's on them in a lot of cases um, means that only 10% of the nearly 3 million stamps were actually sold, um, which means that the stamps, they were left with 2.7 million stamps once they were invalidated for use in January. We'll see what their creative solution was in a few minutes. Uh, there are not a lot of imperfects of this set. Only 300 were, were released to the Belgian government and celebrities, um, and all 450 were produced. Um, there are a few blocks of four that exist, um, but they're not plentiful and they're extremely, extremely expensive. Uh, just a background for those of you who like rates and roots, the five centime stamp covered the cost of a postal card with five words or less on it, as well as printed material between 25 and 100 grams. Um, note the Discobolus here, as we talked about. This is actually a copy of Myron's Discobolus uh, a, a statue, um, which is in the Vatican Museum. Um, I got interested a few months ago in this, how often, because I thought I've seen this a lot. Um, and there's something like 400 Olympic stamp issues from a variety of countries have used this either for cancellations or for stamps. Um, so in some ways, it really is the image of the Olympics. Uh, there's the Discobolus, and I think they did a very good job of, of copying that. There are very few full sheets of this available, um, but this is one of the five centime ones, and it's beautiful. Uh, this is just an example of uh, what's meant by internal use postcard with five words or less. There we go. Um, that's all you were allowed to put on it. There's the quadrica. This was used for a 10 cent valued postcard for internal rate. Um, and you could write obviously as much as you wanted on it uh, if you wanted to, to, to use that. Um, these stamps were not valid for international use when they were printed. Um, the UPU did not like the use of commemoratives. Um, and so it wasn't until of August of 1920 that commemorative stamps were actually approved for use to certain uh, international destinations. Um, so that will come in a moment. And the 15 cent covered the rate for an ordinarily, an ordinary internal letter weighing up to 20 grams. So what did they do with the 2.7 million stamps that they could now not sell? Well, they got very creative and they decided to overprint them, making all of them 20 cent um, uh, overprints. Um, these are actually really fascinating to collect. Um, obviously, the fact that they're overprints and the sheets were all um, it, not terribly well aligned means you get some really fascinating placements of these. The only ones I'll warn you against, if you find one where the um, the overprint appears at the top and it's upside down. Um, most likely it's forged. So whenever I wanna buy one of those, I always say to the dealer, look, if it's legitimate and you get a certificate, I'll pay for it. If it's not legitimate, you pay for the certificate. And in seven out of eight cases now, uh, it's been a forgery. Those were kept on sale through 1931. So 10 years after the Olympics were over. Um, they were invalidated uh, for sale um, on January 15th, 1921. Uh, oh, sorry, for use on January 15th, 1921. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to find one from that day, but this is the latest, um, my latest use, which is three days from the end. You can find them after that date. Um, the, there were a lot of regulations that were changing um, in Europe and especially in Belgium in terms of postal rates and usages. And sometimes I think the post office people, especially in smaller post offices, just didn't really have an idea of what, um, of what the rules were at the time. And so they sneak through. 
obviously, once the UPU approved the use of the stamps for international mail, uh, first to uh, France, the UK, Switzerland, then the Belgian Congo, Rwanda, uh, they needed specimen stamps for the um, overseas post offices to be able to verify that these were indeed legitimate. Uh, and then in October, that was increased. Uh, the usages were increased to countries of Italy, Japan, US, and Australia. You can find some incredible illegal foreign uses of these stamps. I have a couple of them. Uh, this is my favorite. This is the only one that anyone knows of that was ever got through and was sent to, to uh, Brazil. Um, and I think it probably was because the stamp was on the picture side, which was not uncommon in those days. Um, and so it was just stamped. Nobody bothered. They just checked, okay, it's going to a foreign destination. This covers the rate. And so they just stamped it. But you can find some really interesting ones. I have a couple to Canada, which are just spectacular. Okay, the advertising cancellations. To make the public more aware of the, uh, of the Olympic Games, they decided to uh, create a series of machine cancellations to advertise them. And uh, these were offered at 10 post offices in the five largest cities in Belgium between June and September of 1920. This is really what makes this Olympics most interesting from a philatelic standpoint. Because while the Greeks had cancellations at temporary post offices all around the Olympic Games, this is the first time promotional cancellations were used. Uh, so they were used in the Dutch-speaking North, Ghent and Antwerp. Uh, Brussels is officially bilingual, and then Charleroi and Liège are French-speaking. Now, there's a lot of information on this slide, most of which we don't need to worry ourselves with. But if you look over here, quickly, two post offices in Antwerp, four in Brussels, one in Charleroi, two in Ghent, and one in Liège. If you look on this side, this is Lawrence Yonker's rarity index. Some of them are incredibly common, and maybe you have no trouble finding them. Then there are ones like Charleroi, which is five times less common, and Ghent 1, which is 20 times less common. And there's always been the question as to why those two, and I guess you could throw Ghent 3 in there too, why they are so much more rare than the other uh, cancellations. Um, and people have suggested it was because um, Ghent and Charleroi handled, uh, hosted very little in terms of pre-qualifying Olympic events, but uh, I don't think that's really the case because Charleroi didn't host any at all, so it should be the most rare. We'll get to why I think this is the case in a minute. Um, French dominant uh, speaking areas had French cancellation at the top. Dutch had, had the dominant areas had Dutch at the top. Here's an example. Brussels, the French speaking capital, French at the top, Dutch at the bottom. Uh, Ghent, uh, Dutch speaking, Dutch at the top, French at the bottom. Okay, so why are they less common? Um, I did some research and I discovered that the least common of all uh, in each city, if there were multiple ones, were the ones at the first post office. And I found out, not that it's any great surprise, um, that the number one post office is the administrative center of the post office. And that's You look at this, this is Ghent 3. And at one time, um, this would have been an important post office because of all of the mercantile activity going on. But now it was the central administrative post office and many less people went to it. Uh, so I was able to figure out that Ghent 1 actually processed almost 40% less mail than the Ghent 3 post office, which was located at the train station, which makes sense. People come into town, they have mail in their pocket, and they post it when they get off the train. 
So the rarest of the rare is the Ghent 1 uh, cancellation. And this is a beauty, such a good strike. Um, there are less than 20 of those known um, and um, at this point, anyway. Uh, very beautiful. Dutch on the top, uh, French on the bottom. There are varieties of these. Um, there are some consistent varieties, such as Antwerp 1, um, which should have been spelled um, uh, Septembre for the abbreviation of the month in French, but instead is misspelled as Septembre, and that appears on all the Antwerp 1 ones. Uh, there are some where the clerk got lazy and just didn't put the year in. Um, and Antwerp 6 seems to have been a particularly popular place for that to happen. Um, there's a consistent misspelling of the word Brussel with two L's instead of E-L um, on the Brussels 1 post office. Uh, this is a really minor variety, but to show you, um, there's no dash here um, on Brussels South. Um, this is an interesting one. It appears in two forms. Um, here, the Roman numeral is used in place of the Arabic day numeral. Um, and these are, these are somewhat rare, but the ones that are really rare are when that happens and the date is put upside down. Um, so it's inverted. Um, and those are actually very hard to find. Um, there, are notor there are notorious examples of particular post offices that says Belgium where the clerk seemed to want to do as little work as they possibly could and very often just didn't bother to check. Then there's the Cirque Roma stamp. There's a circular date stamp that was issued only at the Olympic, post, uh, Olympic Stadium. Uh, this is a spectacular copy that I have. Um, it has all three of the Olympic stamps and incredibly beautiful strikes on it. They're, they're quite rare. Then there are vignettes or, or Cinderella's and postcards that were issued. Uh, this is a, a poster from the Olympic Games. It was quite small. Again, a bad decision in terms of its um, use as an advertising tool because it very easily have gotten lost on a billboard. But remember the image of the discus thrower there because there's a famous vignette that was created for to raise money for the games that clearly is a copy of the poster. It's a very nice card. Uh, it's very unusual to find these vignettes on a card tied to the card um, with um, Olympic stamps on it. It's uh, quite interesting to do that. They came in five colors. Um, by, from my experience, the brown is the hardest one to find. Um, and if you think to yourself, gosh, these stamps look rough, these are actually really good copies of them. Um, usually they're much worse perforated than this uh, and quite beat up. The paper's quite cheap. We don't know how many were produced. We don't know who uh, engraved them or printed them. And there's this beautiful Swiss card. Um, the Swiss had hoped to issue a uh, a stamp to help raise money as a semi-postal to send their team to the Olympic Games. But there's a law in the Swiss postal regulation that says no Swiss stamp can advertise an event outside the country. So they were relegated to producing this, holding a competition to produce this beautiful Cinderella here. Um, this also was obviously entered in the competition. Um, I like this one uh, partly because it's so incredibly rough. Um, you can see surely why they picked this one, but also because I think the javelin thrower looks a bit like uh, Beavis of Beavis and Butthead, um, if you're old enough to remember that. And there were a series of postcards, uh, post, yeah, postcards that were produced um, by the company of Verlas. Um, there are 10 of those. They're in a beautiful kind of... Um, Mo new modern kind of um, style. Um, they're very, very expensive. I don't own any of them, but everyone collects them that loves um, early modern style. Very beautiful. 
Um, there are a couple of vignettes that are always passed off as having to do with the Olympic Games, but actually don't. Um, this was a vignette produced to advertise Hungary's bid to get the Olympic Games. It comes from much earlier. Um, and I love the slogan down here, make, make this year's, make the Olympics a Hungarian Olympics, uh, which is fun. But that's nothing to do with 1920 in Antwerp. And then last of all, um, the Hungarians pr produced a lot of matchbox labels, uh, which aren't philatelic, but are quite beautiful. Um, sad, considering that they didn't get to go to the games. Um, so here are two of those and uh, beautiful opening, um, uh, beautiful picture of the opening ceremonies. And the, this is, I won't pronounce his name because it's complicated. Um, they're a great shot putter. Then there's the Holy Grail of Olympic philately. And this is so rare that I couldn't even find a picture of it on Google. Um, and that is the registration label of which only 600-ish were issued at the Olympic Stadium. Um, it has the classic Antwerp um, registration stamp on it printed and then written above in hand, it says Olympic Stadium. Um, and that's, that's the only thing I don't have in my collection that I uh, would love to someday if I can get a second mortgage on my house. Okay, well, that concludes our presentation. I just want to say, if you like sports philately, uh, if you like the Olympics, um, there's a wonderful group called Sports Philatelists International. Um, they have a world-class journal that goes back 50-plus years. Uh, most of it, only the last four years, are behind a paywall. So if you're interested in sports and stamps, you can go check it out at sportsstamps.org. Um, it contains some of the greatest scholars on sports philately that I know. Um, and there's an email there, member at sportsstamps.org, if you're interested. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, your patience, and I hope I haven't bored you too much. And that concludes our, particip our uh, presentation. Uh, thank you, Greg. That was uh, truly a lot of information there. I had no idea that there was that much philately attached to the Belgian game or the Antwerp games, I should say. Um, if you, if some of you may have joined us late. Uh, if there's any questions that you have for Greg, you can click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen and uh, type in your question there and I will answer, ask those questions of Greg uh, right now. I have a couple to start off. You mentioned about the Olympic oath and the Olympic flag being the first time at these Olympics. I also read somewhere uh, that this is the first time that they released doves. Is that true? That is actually true. Um, and I, I think that these were not just doves. I think they were the doves that were used. They were actually carrier pigeons that had been used during World War I. So, yeah, that's where that starts as well. It certainly ties into we're coming at the end of the First World War and sort of uh, peace being a, a theme yeah. uh, internationally, obviously. Uh, what, you, you, you touched on this a little bit in your presentation, but uh, how did your interest in the Olympics, in Olympic philately, come about? I, I understand probably from the Belgian uh, connection with that, but uh, and do you are you collecting in any other Olympics areas of philately? I, I'm not. I'm not because it is actually a. Uh, because it, it's actually this is the least expensive Olympics to collect. Um, some of the uh, earlier ones are just prohibitively expensive, and especially a lot of the winter games. So I just stick to this one, although if I see something reasonably priced, I, I always grab it. Um, for me, for me, my grandfather was in the U.S. Army in World War I, and he told us stories about being in Belgium at the end of the, at the ceasefire, and I found it a very interesting story. So when I started collecting Belgian stamps, it just kind of tied into it because I kept reading about these games of peace where all of the quality athletes, quote, um, had been either wounded or had been killed. And it was uh, was just kind of a miracle that it even happened. Right. Uh, we have a question. This might be a question for somebody who is a sports, international sports philatelist member. 
is there an image of the 1920 Olympics registration label on their website or an, an issue of the journal? I don't know if you came across there. I think I do think that there is, um, and I think that the um, I think though because it was a PDF, I wasn't able to pull it off. Um, but yeah, if you're going to find it anywhere, you're going to find it in that. And I think it's in an article that Lawrence Yonker wrote. Uh, I thought it was interesting that, uh, and I'm certainly appropriate that the stamps, the, the original idea behind the postage stamps was to then sort of help with wounded veterans. Do you know how much was raised? I mean, I, I guess I can sort of do the math quickly in my head if I wanted to, but yeah. do you have any idea how much was raised for the wounded veterans? I, I actually should, and I don't. But uh, something um, something in the neighborhood of a million of the stamps were produced. So what is that, $50,000, something like yeah. that? Yeah, about that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, which would have been a sizable amount of money at the time. Oh, or stamp, a million of the stamps were sold. So it would have been a sizable amount. And, and this was for wounded veterans in, just in Belgium? Or yeah. For, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was curious, and you sort of uh, made a point of it too, that why do you think the American bank note company wanted to produce so many uh, of the, I, the, the three million? Well, <laughs> I, 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 my, well, there's a couple of things, you know, I mean, I, I was born in the U.S., so I can say this. Um, I mean, there's the business side of it, which is, you know, the more we can sell, the more profitable it is for us. There's oh. also a, it. Living in Canada, and you know this, Scott, I mean, Canada is m a much larger geographical country than the U.S., but we have one-tenth the population. And I sometimes think that the American banknote company just thought to themselves, well, this is not going to be nearly enough, so we'll give you a discount. You can buy more. You'll be able to sell them but because, you know, there's not a lot of knowledge about how large particular countries are. I mean, Belgium's about the size of New Jersey. You know, so it's a pretty small country. That's the only thing I can conjecture. Yeah. Did you did you ever find out who was the designer at the American Bank Note Company for the? No, uh, I contacted um, both the um, Smithsonian, which is uh, mm -hmm. where the papers lie, and the National Postal Museum, and also the Belgian Arc, and nobody has any record of it. Uh, you also, I thought the fascinating part was uh, later on when you were sort of showing us the Cinderella's and the vignettes and the postcards. Um, and you mentioned who designed those or wh how those came into group. Any idea about the numbers in terms of numbers that were issued, created uh, for each of those? No, there's no record of the of the Belgian um, discus thrower. Nobody, nobody knows the numbers, um, but I think it probably wasn't very high because they're pretty rare. And to find them postally used is really unusual. They can, they can be quite expensive. The same thing with the Swiss stamps. I mean, the, the, the Cinderella itself is expensive. If you find the Cinderella on a card, it's pretty rare to do that. And they usually catalog for 60 or $70. So I think they're pretty rare. I, I can't imagine all that many of them are produced or they just, or they just ended up on, you know, mail that was thrown out, which is always the case too. Yeah. Uh, if our attendees are interested, somebody did write in to tell us that the 1920 registration label can be found. Whoop, I lost it here. It's in an issue of the journal in uh, volume 36, number four in, in 1998. So got it written down. If somebody wants to find a picture of that, that's where they can find it. Thank you for the, for the person who wrote in. Yeah. Um, I don't have any more questions at the top of my head. Is there, if, there's, if anybody wants to write something in quickly, we want to thank uh, all of those who attended today's session as well. And uh, we also want to thank Greg uh, for this presentation. Uh, if you're looking to, excuse me here, Greg, we want to thank you for this very informative presentation. Remember, if you missed any part of this presentation or would like to view it again, please visit the APS YouTube page and share this presentation with your friends. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the APS YouTube page for all of our future stamp chats and other video content. If you're not a member of the APS, please join today and become part of our stamp community. For more information for that, visit us at stamps.org. With that, we want to thank you and have a great day.